And so I, um, I was a student of, of ZAV um, in a program called Design Strategy. It is also a program part of um, George Brown College. Um, before that, I studied sciences um, at McMaster University. I studied life sciences. Um, and Zav asked me to come here to talk about why I'm doing data visualization. Um, he really wanted, he really emphasized on the magnet, like what really appealed to me um, in this profession. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm independent. Um, I've been independent for almost a year now. And I want to start off with defining what data visualization is. It's a very tricky term to define. There's no objective agreement on it. Um, but I'll tell you what I see it as. So um, the definition I would go with is that data visualization is visualizing quantitative data, which is very important. For me, it's quantitative. Um, and the most important outcome of that is it allows for comparisons. You can compare different things. Um, you can probably see new trends. And a lot of time, what's most valuable from that is allow, it allows for insights. Um, a lot of my work is usually more just comparison and usability. It doesn't go as far as trends or insights. Um, a lot of the projects I'm going to be showing are personal projects. And um, here's what I did this year. There's a really popular snack spot in North York. It, uh, they sell these rice hot dogs. It's a Korean snack spot. And um, I visited this for the first time before COVID happened. And um, if you look at the menu, um, <laughs> The menu was hard for me to read and understand because um, there's actually a lot of things that had to hold constant in terms of variables. So I'm lactose intolerant. I can't have anything with milk. And so I had to figure out which ones had um, cheese and um, try to hold those, like, you know, exclude that from my, my options. And then I had to look at, there's also options for like toppings. You can add like potato toppings to these. Um, some of them have, it comes with it and some of them it's optional add on. Um, I also had to compare price, which is like a lot of things to compare, right? Um, and so when I um, was thinking about Project Do, I was thinking maybe I could visualize a food menu, um, which is a little bit unheard of, right? And so I started doing a couple of sketches and this was, you know, a series of initial sketches I made. Um, and the one that really stuck out was these circles. It just was a cross section of this, right? <laughs> they look like cells, but you know, these were the ones that I thought maybe there's something interesting here. So if you look at all the attributes that you can define for each of these um, items, there's a lot. Um, and I came up with like a brochure and this is what I came up with. And um, there's generally three components to this. So these are all cross sections of um, these rice hot dogs. So we look at the type of hot dog it has, the type of filling and topping. So sometimes it's optional, sometimes it comes with it. Um, and the way I grouped it was I had all the cheese ones like over here, right? And all the ones without cheese was over here. And coincidentally, it ranked really well in terms of price, so it goes from low to high. And so for me, as a person who's lactose intolerant, I just look on the left-hand side, right? I would ignore the right-hand side. But their cheese products are really popular, so a lot of people might just go for the ones with cheese. Um, excuse me. So this is kind of what I mean by data visualization in terms of allows for comparison. Um, and I think, you know, I'll take this moment to talk a little bit about personal projects because I think they're very, very valuable. Um, from my understanding, you guys are all students, um, you're in interaction design, and um, there is very likely a day where you're probably working for a company or agency in the creative field. And it's very likely that one day you'll be very bored, and it just happens. Um, there's going to be, you know, a lot of lulls in working uh, from time to time, right? And um, I think personal projects has a lot of value in helping explore what you're good at and exploring your style, helping you build um, even a portfolio to express the kind of work you want to do. A lot of people kind of just take, a, you know, just kind of gloss over personal projects, but there's a lot of value and a lot of things you can learn just from doing them. So I encourage you in the future to consider that if you ever feel like you want to experiment with something or try something new um, with very, very low risk. Um, and they're very good for developing a portfolio. Um, so that's what I mean by data visualization. Um, next part we talk about is the how. So how did it get into this? Um, so when I was at George Brown College um, studying design strategy, one of my instructors introduced me to a book called Information is Beautiful. Um, in this book, there are a lot of these visualizations which um, you know, look like this and they're really interesting. And I never really thought twice about people who are actually designed these things. I knew these existed, right? You see them all over the place, but I never really thought twice about um, the person behind it. And so um, right after graduation, I um, got a job at a startup and it was very much an operations role. And um, when I was working there, I was thinking to myself, I really want to focus my career in the creative industry. Um, I want to work in design. 
and um, I decided to figure out what direction that would look like. So I did a lot of personal projects. So personal projects is a big theme here, right? So I did a lot of personal projects on my own time, on weekends and evenings. And I created a lot of things that looked like this. They were just all exploration. They didn't really mean much, um, but they were interesting in understanding what I was good at. Um, and, and they actually helped me build a portfolio where I was able to land a job at Kantar. So Kantar is a huge market research company. Um, all of our clients are Fortune 500 clients. And um, I showed them my portfolio and that was really appealing to them because I showed them that I was interested in this. So I was doing a lot of PowerPoint reports, but my job there was a lot um, in consulting, right? I'm not here to make your slides pretty. I'm here to tell you why your slides should exist, right? Why certain slides um, could add value to your story when you're uh, proposing it or pitching it to a client. And so um, as I was working in Kantar, I still did a lot of personal projects to keep expanding my creative style and keep understanding um, what I was interested in because it takes a lot of time to build the self-awareness. And um, I post a lot of my work on social media, I share it. And in the spring of last year, someone saw something on Instagram and they reached out to me for a freelance project. And that was my first ever client. And so um, I, he was a lawyer and um, he was the lawyer in the States and he needed some help communicating series of amendments to the US bankruptcy code. So all of his clients um, are students dealing with student loan debt. And student loan debt is a big problem in the States and he helps them um, relieve that, um, that loan when he presents their cases. And uh, when he presents his cases uh, for his clients, he needs to explain all the amendments made to the bankruptcy code to justify why they should be relieved, right? And so I made um, a series of cards. So there's a timeline here and there's a total of seven amendments that he talks about, but this timeline um, summarizes all the amendments and each card represents one amendment. So we have the front and the back. The front is pretty much lay term summary, right? Um, a quick overview of what this amendment did. And the back is, has all the technical terms and a lot of jargon, right? But if you want to get nitty gritty, you look at the back. And I created a series of cards where it provides more context to um, his cases, right? If you look at the history of student loan debt, um, you know, it's clear there's a problem here, right? And so this was my first client and it gave me a lot of confidence um, um, to think about maybe I want to do something independently. And so I left my job last year in the summer um, and when I left my job, I was very conscious of the fact that just because I declared to the world I'm independent, opportunities isn't, aren't, isn't just gonna flock to me, right? And so I leveraged some existing skills I had, which is social media. So I did a mix of social media and data viz. So social, social media is where I engage professionally a lot of the times, and that's where my income was coming from, help me pay the bills. Data viz was something I continued to expand and explore because um, the things I wanna do isn't very much in demand. It's not very much um, understood. Um, the things, data viz is big, right? It's like diverse type of, um, it's a diverse industry, inter interdisciplinary, and it covers many, many um, industry sectors, right? So um, the things that people understand, that people think people want to see are, are, are things like dash dashboards, right? And this is um, something I pulled from John Hopkins as looking at COVID data. And this is very useful. This is very important for people to make crucial decisions, right? Even for lay people to understand what's going on in the world. Um, and this is a form of data viz, right? Um, but however, this isn't something that I'm interested in or something that I'm good at. I don't have skills to make something like this. Um, I just don't have the talent for it, right? And that's something I identified pretty early on. Um, and you might be wondering, like, I feel like, you know, you're going through, you're going against the grain. Like, why make it so challenging for yourself? Why are you still in it when you don't see a lot of opportunities right away? And um, and here's where I talk about the why. This is where the magnet comes um, is important and Zav wanted me to talk about. I think there are three main reasons why I'm interested in data visualization um, and why I continue to push for it. And I think there's a lot of value for it. Um, and I'm doing a lot I can to establish that value and provide a lot of educational resources to help people understand what it can do. So the first thing um, is a more selfish reason and it's um, a flow state. I think this is super important to uh, enjoy what you're doing and kind of feel time slip by. I mean, if you look at painters and sculptors, right? They, they, they don't realize that, you know, hours pass by just like that. And, um, a lot of things I do is in static format and a lot of it is manually made. I do it in Illustrator. And so when I made something like this, so this is, um, I, I collect data on myself. I looked at my physical health and mental health and um, I was able to show it over time. So I collected a lot of data, right? But every single circuit here was manually placed. There was no program that generated this for me automatically. Um, and so this is a process I, I very much enjoy. Um, even though it's laborious, but I feel very satisfied when, when I'm able to complete it um, after, you know, putting the time to finishing it. Um, the second reason I do data visualization is because there's uncharted territory, which ties into the fact that people don't understand its value yet. 
a lot of projects I do are things that no one has ever seen before and that's super appealing to me. I have a lot of ideas that no one can see or understand um, and I've just never seen it done before, right? So, um, and one of the projects I did, and this is a good example of it, and it, it's looking at um, video game mechanics. So if you guys play video games, you'll know this game. This is God of War. It's a 2018 version. And I was very fascinated by frame animation, um, which is looking at how certain moves, um, how quick they are or how fast they are, and sort of assessing the risk and rewards of it. So there's two moves here I just try to visualize. Um, and here we have um, frames. So each of these blocks represents one frame. This just represents a character. And this represents what happens once the frame is like the frame animation startup, this move is done and um, the outcome of it. So in this case, what happens is it has a short startup frame animation and um, the weapon will hit one enemy. In this case, um, is a longer startup frame animation, but it hits a group of enemies. And there's a cost for that, right? So in this case, you have to be level two to be able to use this skill. And um, it, there's a cost, you actually have to purchase it with experience points. So I'm gonna play this so you can see. So this is much uh, shorter and this is much um, longer. You can probably see, yeah, there we go. So yeah, so that one already hit, right? This is still going on. So this kind of helps you assess and understand the game mechanics, which I thought was really interesting. Okay, and this is another, another one I did more recently. Um, it's looking at board games. So a lot of my process is very user-centric. It's driven by usability. Um, if you look at, um, so this is based on the board game called Bang. It's a pretty old game, but I played this a lot when I was in school. And this was targeted at teaching, helping, it's visual aid that assists experienced players teaching this game to beginners. From my observation of playing board games, complex games um, that usually take more than one turn to learn, like one, one round of games to learn, usually require an experienced player at the table to guide everyone. It's very unlikely you'll find new players play a complicated game like Bang or <laughs> Settlers of Catan just from the game manual. Usually you'll have someone coaching you, right? And teaching you as you play it. Um, and that makes it a lot more fun, right? And so when I was teaching this game to people, it's so hard to teach it because there's so many things to consider. Um, and I'm just working with air. I'm not working with anything. I'm just telling people some things they're doing wrong and I just correct them as I, as I play the game. But this one was very much made to help be, um, experienced players teach beginners. and. I'll show you an example of one of them, that, um, these, these cards. So this lays out all the playing cards in the game um, that you can draw and play. And um, a simple histogram. So histogram is basically a count. It's just a count of things. So I counted all the cards. Um, there are a total of 12 playing cards in this section. And I just did a count of them. And I've played this hundreds of times, but I never realized it. But there's certain cards that are more valuable just due to scarcity. It's a very simple thing, but you can see a lot. And you can, you can really devise tactics and understanding how to win this game, right? Um, and each card has an attribute. I assign an attribute. So some of them could be offensive, defensive, utility-based, or risk, right? Some of them could be very risky to you. Um, and so you see that this game is very much offensively driven, right? It's meant to be, it's meant to go by quick. It's not meant to drag on for, for ages. Um, and so this is interesting, right? It's a way to compare the data and um, see different things about it, understand how it works. So the last reason is growing pains. And this is super important because learning anything is not easy. Um, when I initially started, I did spend a little bit of time learning D3. And you might have heard of this. It's a JavaScript based library. Um, and a lot of people in data viz use this. A lot of people in industry use this. Um, and they get paid a lot of money to make these projects, right? Um, it's a really hard program to do well on um, and master and create things that people haven't seen before. Traditionally, when you, when you learn something like this, you would copy and paste and like, you know, you will do what's been done and you try to learn from that, right? But a lot of people are making novel projects out of this. And it's really interesting to see what's been made. Um, I spent some time to learn this. I, I spent about like six months, right? And I didn't really en enjoy any of that. I was able to make a couple of things, you know, and make some things work, but it wasn't something I really liked. Um, it wasn't really fun for me. Um, Another project I did was looking at a collection of Kipling bags. So there's Kipling um, collection. Um, and I was looking at all the bags in this specific collection. So here, each of these represents one bag. And um, there's certain attributes to find each of these bags. For example, this looks at size. Um, and then we have color, right, for each bag. Um, we have a number of zip pockets it has. So it just kind of defines each of these products. And for me, that's pretty interesting. And it's something that you can only achieve in this way. Um, so I pretty much use a product catalog, right? And everything I do, I try to understand format. I try to understand why it makes sense to use one, for one format over the, over the other. You can tell stories in so many ways. You can tell stories in a video. You can tell stories through voice. You can tell stories through web, through mobile. You can do a lot in different formats, but it's important to understand why certain formats work better than others. 
And for me, because I specialize in static work and I try to focus on print as well, um, like visual aids or books, um, I try to understand at what point am I doing this project where it makes sense for this format and you cannot achieve the result anywhere else. And it's like this question of, you know, why would someone purchase a chef knife that's handmade, it takes a long time to make, it's really expensive, over a factory made one, right? And this is the question I'm always trying to answer with everything I do. It's not easy to identify the answer, but that's an important one to answer. And, you know, everything is, I think, is driven by just doing things that only I can create. And that's pretty important because why create something that someone else can make, right? And I think this is a, a key thing. If you've ever learned about value proposition, it's understanding what is something that only you can do that someone, no, no one else can do, right? Why do you buy certain products? What is it that they can offer you that nothing else can offer, right? Think about Apple, think about Nike, like what, what can they do that no one else can? And why do people keep buying that? And um, in terms of understanding what I, only I can make, and I think this is where it's important for you to consider as well, as you develop a career, you have to think about what is something that you can do that no one else can do. And that helps you not only understand your value proposition to your work and career, but also I, I think equally important is understanding your value proposition to what you can contribute to society and to the world. And so that's my talk um, on why I do data visualization. So if any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, if you'd like to see more of my work, you can visit um, at my website.